Okay, hi everyone. So I see you all joined. Okay, so okay. Okay, this is also not. Okay, so we're gonna continue with this lecture on interaction that we talked about, that we started out last time. Um, okay, you should be seeing this. So we talked about lenses, you know, how you, how you can uh, focus on certain nodes of a graph and look everything else in the periphery. And we looked at lenses you can design for volume rendering, we looked at other lenses where you can show, show objects, sort of abstract lenses. And so on, right? We talked about all these lenses, fisheye lens. Today, so let's go and talk a little more about this. So, one very famous lens is called the table lens. It's like from 1994. Basically, it's just like make a table bigger in some places and compress it in other places. Like, for example, here, if this is the table here, up here, then you uh, basically apply this transfer function. <clears throat> Where you, where you map the scaling. So here you have a bigger scaling. That means these guys here, these cells here will be mapped to a bigger space on the screen, right? And that's what you see here. You know, so here you see more detail and here you just see numbers, right? So that's basically the essence of a table lens. It's a pretty famous lens, very, very old, but very, very well known. Like almost every paper science writes this. Another one is the perspective wall. I think we've seen this already here. Right? We talked about the perspective wall here. Sort of a bifocal lens. You look at this like sort of, you know, <clears throat> it looks like a bulletin board from the front that sort of extends perspectively to the, to the left and right. So these become more, has, have more resolution. Those side panels have less resolution, but you can then move it back and forth and see other things in the higher resolution lower and, 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 and the, you know, you see basically if you move it to the, from left to right, you start seeing these parts of the wall in higher resolution and then this stuff moves to the side, right? So you can sort of influence that in this way. So, you know, so as I said, these all have like sort of physical met metaphor, physical counterparts, and you just try to map them, make them computerized, right? So it's like easy to understand because they have physical correspondence, right? That's easy to understand for a user to use them. Okay, so another one is this magic lens. You have a magic lens, you have like basically a regular map, then you have the some street structure underneath or like could be under, could be wiring under the, under the, you know, under the surface, for example, you want to like see where the power lines go and where the, where the, uh, you know, water lines go. So you have this magic lens that sort of exposes this, like you take this lens and move it around and it exposes like underneath this sort of, you know, this uh, abstract information. You know, it's called a magic lens, right? So a conventional map here, then some sort of location of services that you would like to see before, before you drill a hole into the ground, right? You want to like see if that you don't hit the water line or something like, like this. So you basically use this kind of lens to expose that, why right? it's called, you know, magic lens, right? So you need basically two data, two sets of data, you need the map, and this this under this underlying information and then something that maps maps them together right the correspondence association kind of thing and then you can you can move this around if you like you know another one is zooming and panning that's a interact very interesting activity right if you want to like go if you have let's say you have a large map <clears throat> and you want to quickly go from one place to another right so like panning would be the one where you just go you let's say you only look at this part here that's covered by window number one, then you move this over, then you number window number two, then you have another one, three and four, keep doing back and forth, right? Like this is basically the window of interest and only this would be shown on the screen, right? And, and then this is, zooming is basically when you take a particular part and you zoom in, right? You make it larger, okay? So panning is when you slide and zoom is when you, enlarge okay you know so this this kind of metaphor here zoom and pan at the same time basically lets you like if you if you just do this if you just want to like 
zoom in somewhere and then zoom in somewhere else, right? You have to first zoom out, pan over, and zoom back in, right? Zoom out. Like let's say you're zooming in here to basically zoom out, so you can sort of so you sort of see where you are, right? So where you know that you know where you're going, right? So you have to first zoom out because you want to know you want to know where you have to move the lens to. Let's say you're moving in here, you're zooming into A, but you want to move to B. Then the first thing you have to do is like first zoom out so you can see the whole map, then move the lens over and then zoom back in, right? That's that's the only way you can do this. Like move the center of interest over to B, right? First you're at A, then you move out, zoom out, move the lens over the center of interest is now at B, zoom back in and you suddenly see B at the same time. So this is a little bit awkward, right? Because now you first have to zoom in, zoom out, look at everything, move over and then zoom back in, right? So there's a nice, interesting concept called scale space diagram, which does this at the same time, right? So basically you have a map here and you zoom out and you pan at the same time, right? It's like, you know, you zoom out and pan at the same time, it's slightly from right to left, right? You basically pan at the same time while you're zooming in and out, then you zoom back in. So I'll show you like a video that shows this, okay? So I made, I found this video here that shows this very nicely. Smooth and efficient zooming, right? So you don't have to go in and out. So let's just it. So first, describe the few regions that you want to like. So you want to create basically this sort of travel across and look at different highlights at the same time. You know, so basically, mark those regions of interest. Start at one, move out, zoom back in. So that's what that is. It's like zoom out and pan zoom at the same time. So another thing is where you want to like basically when you scroll something, you know, when you scroll something, sometimes when you scroll, you want to skip over something really fast, right? So if you, you know, this is the static view of a file, then if you scroll slowly, you're going to look at all the content, right? But if you scroll fast, you'll only see like one, the middle of the screen in, 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 high, in high resolution and everything sort of moves very fast through, right? So you scroll very fast, it only shows you a few things at the same time and everything else is very, very small, okay? So that's been efficient navigation of large documents, right? Just like hi highlights are shown in full detail and everything else gets sort of, you know, suppressed. So it's like a level of detail zoom. It's another, another way where you have to, have to zoom in. Then another one is this semantic zoom. Like just they basically change the content of what you're seeing, right? So this is like all the ships at the same time. This is like one ship, but more detail. And here this is, you zoom in even more, you, you'll see actually a lot of detail, right? So this is the semantic zoom, right? It's not just geometric. It's not just like low passing everything. It's basically really try to add more detail as you go, right? The details here are not shown at all. Right? It's not even shown in a small scale. It just suddenly appears, okay? It's basically exactly what happens in Google Maps, right? In Google Maps, you see like you zoom in from, from, the, from the country level to the, to the state level, to the city level, to the street level, right? And when you do this, it's very continuous, right? You'll, you'll always, things, you know, so things appear 
slow, this gets slowly blended in, right? As you zoom in, the things appear like the streets slowly get blended in. First, the, the streets get slowly blended in, and then the buildings, the bigger streets are blended in, and, the, and the, even the smaller streets are blended in, right? When you try this out, right? Then you really, it's a blending experience, right? You zoom in and out, out, it's like blending. Slowly it appears, there's no sudden jump, right? It's slowly, it quickly, appears, it slowly appears gets sort of blended in and that's exactly what what this what this this zooming actually is right the semantic zooming where you map the lower where you map the lower resolution detail or higher resolution detail into the lower resolution image and you have a correspondence and you slow, slowly blend that into the onto the other one okay so you know so what you can also do is you can show different levels of aspects of information right on a map you can either show the parking lots, bars, or restaurants, and then you can zoom in on price range. You can zoom in on reference, and so on. Right? For example, you can you can have like also zooming that requires access rights. Like you, for example, some people are only allowed to see a human being. Some people are allowed it's a male. Some people are allowed it's a it's a policeman. Some people are allowed to see British policemen. Some people actually not are allowed to see the entire person. Right? So this goes like left and right. So this is like really extreme semantic zoom where you really show only as much detail, only a sort of an icon of what you're allowed to see and the rest you don't, you not get to see, you don't get to see. So then it's like this. Another one is like cement is, is uh, exploded views where you show a, an object, but you explode out the parts, right? We've seen this, you know, before. You know, and it's like this. I've probably seen this in, in in lots of engineering drawings, right? Where people sort of draw the parts, explode it out, so you sort of know where they go, right? You can sort of see the screw goes here, and then this goes here, and so on. If you can sort of put it together and make it this make this device out of it, right? But you can also see what it's composed of. And the same thing you can also use for information visualization. So, for example, here's this video that is something we made. Um, like exploded view paradigm for this, this to disambiguate scatter plots, right? And you look at so, for example, if you have this scatter plot here, right? You can't really, it's really hard to see where what the individual distributions look like, right? You see, like, there's a red one, and there's a purple one, a pink one, a green one, orange one, but you don't really know, that you, don't, you can't even tell the shape of it, right? Wouldn't it be great if you could sort of see that and still at the same time also see how it all goes together? So you can use this exploded view paradigm for this. You can like go here. It's sort of used this pair, firework paradigm. Let's see it again. It's kind of slow because it's recording. Okay, so let's go here and then. So now at this, you can sort of see where they go together, but you can also appreciate the overall the shapes of all of these different clusters, right? You can see. The green clusters sort of expanded in the in the x-axis, right? And the the, the 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 red one is very compact. The orange one is more distributed, you know. And the, the light blue one is very very compact. You can sort of see this. Of course, now you can also recognize them here again in the middle, right? But before you really didn't know that, right? But now you can see it's like exploded views for scatter plot visualization. Here's another one of those paradigms, exploded view paradigms. Like a simple trajectory. It like slowly decomposes. Okay. That's another one of those, right? So basically. They're all, so this, what these, what these ones showed you, they basically try to show you 
where kind of slowly decompose it. First, I showed you like which scatter plots went very closely together. You know, first I showed you the groups of classes that were closely together in terms of the scatter plot proximity. And then slowly, like basically computed by the Dun index, for example, right? They all had similar Dun index. Although, the, you know, then they started to put them apart in terms of the ranking of this index, right? You know, so you see this how it moves apart. So now let's go a little bit and talk about more about you know um, brushing and linking, okay? Which you're supposed to do for your for your uh, final project, right? You're supposed to create something that's a dashboard and allows you to brush and link. Okay, so what is brushing and linking? Okay, so brushing and linking basically, you you link two visualizations together. Okay, they're basically now you have on a web page there's more than one visualization, like the two or more, right? In a dashboard there's actually a lot more, and you select a subset of points and see the role these points may play in an, in the in another in another view. Okay, so you know, so basically here is like such an example, right? So here's a, the, the <clears throat> a visualization of baseball, of baseball uh, players, okay? The years the players played, how many years? So this is like, you know, the, the salaries these players had, this is the distribution of salaries over, 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 you know, this the, basically these are the high, high salaries, and these are the low salaries, and how long they played in the majors, okay? And how long they played in the majors, and this is uh, average assists versus average putouts, average career home runs over the average career hits. Career hits is Y and like home runs is, is X. And distribution of positions played, okay. So first, where is it now? Okay, here, right. So. So now what we're going to try to figure out is we basically we brush on salaries, okay? Meaning we're going to select only the players with the high salaries, okay? Select the players with the high salaries. So we're going to take a mouse cursor or something like this and just highlight those, like go back, go from here to here and highlight that interval that basically only selects the players in the high salary range. And then we're going to see how they, how these, how these players fair in the other aspects, right? Okay, so you're gonna see here like, okay, these players with the high salaries, they have been this long in the majors, okay? So there's basically a, a, hub, a two bimodal distribution, okay? There's the players that have been not very long in the majors, but more than for three years. And then there's the players, the more experienced players that have been longer, okay? There seems to be a bump. So mid-career doesn't pay very much, apparently, then the higher, more years of pay, but then the end of the career you don't you don't make much money anymore, right? So you can quickly see if you want to make when 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 you're gonna have make more money than if you play baseball, right? You can see like first in the middle in the, in the first half of the career towards the end of the first half and then in the mid beginning of the second half, right? You can sort of see this. And you can also see which positions make money, right? So this position makes a lot of money here. This position makes a lot of money. These positions don't make much money at all. And by the height of this, the height of this histogram tells you basically how many players in your data set have that position, right? So there's obviously a lot more players that have that position than this position. I don't know what the positions are, but, but that's what they are. So in the event, this, this basically tells you how the height of these histograms tell you how many players there are at all, overall in your data set. Also, how many players, what is the distribution overall in your salary and the distribution of, this, of the years. And by brushing on the high salaries, you're gonna see which, like where these high, where these players are distributed, right? So apparently this position pays more and this position pays more, right? And this are not. Most players are either here, here. And then also turns out that, you know, uh, <clears throat> average, Career hits, average career home runs pays pays more. You know, obviously you have to hit. What is it? Uh, average career. What is it? This is career hits. 
So you have to have more career hits. It doesn't really matter the home runs. It doesn't really matter how many home runs you shoot because it's evenly distributed in y-axis, but the hits per year really matters. Right? The batting ability really matters. The better you bet, the, the more salary you make. Okay. Here, average assists versus average put out doesn't really matter that much. Here's an outlier. They're both, both of them. Here's an outlier. There's actually someone who, who, who doesn't have a lot of home runs, but, um, but is on the low end here. This is actually a player. When you look it up, it's like an outlier. When you look it up, it's actually a, a coach and a player at the same time. Okay, so here's like summarized, right? So it seems to be impossible to earn, earn high salary in the first two years. High salary players have a bimodal distribution. Hits per year, a better indicator of salary than hits hit home runs per year. We saw that here, right? Then high paid outlier with low hit rate, uh, hits per home runs and medium hits per year. This is this guy here. But he is person, when you, when you click on it, right, you find out who that person is and you find out that this person is actually a player coach, right? And, and, and here there seems to be, you know, it doesn't really matter. You can, there's two clusters here, right? In terms of the average assist versus average put out, right? And then the high salary players are in each of them. So you know, that's what it means. So you are supposed to make such a dashboard. And notice this dashboard fits on one screen, right? You notice this fits on one screen. There's no like scrolling needed, right? Everything's right at the time. And it is important that you don't have to scroll along in the screen because you want to see the reaction of the dashboard, right? You really want to see how this all goes together, right? If you have to keep scrolling, then you really don't really know like how these things to go together because you have to keep scrolling up and down, right? And you'll, you'll always forget what happened in the upper half of the screen and you're scrolling down on the lower half of the screen when you're scrolling up, right? So you really want to make sure that the dashboard fits on a single screen, okay? And uh, so I want to show you a few dashboards that I collected over the years from students so let me find out these dashboards. Okay, so I collected them here in this here. So let me go. Okay, this is that one. So this has actually sound. Um, I can't hear my sound sound. Okay, this is fine. I don't think you can hear the sound actually. Uh, can you hear the sound? Can someone tell me? I don't think you can. No, I can't hear. Uh, can anybody hear the sound or not? No, I, I can't hear anything. No sound, okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop this for a second. It's a little hard. I, I forgot about this. I have to disconnect. No, I have to search my audio. Okay. Okay, maybe you can hear it now. Can you hear it now? Yeah. Ah, good. I'll go back to the beginning. to use the interface and analyze the data 
so it's quite friendly for colorblind individuals. Um, the font I used was Ubuntu uh, from Google Fonts. The Russian interactions I've chosen are highlighting on uh, the scatter plots. and filtering on both of the bar charts. Pressing reset all resets all of the filters. Okay, what I've set up here is showing that in this relatively small area, mostly in Brooklyn, a little bit in Queens, uh, these neighborhoods count for about a third of all of the fonts in the data set. So this area in Brooklyn uh, apparently is in flux. Uh, it could be from gentrification. Um, and if you look at this point, which is an outlier in terms of sale price, it, it costs way more than the, these other points. This is actually moving to our east, which is a neighborhood that has been undergoing gentrification for a while now. So it could very well be that uh, when Brooklyn is booming, um, and that's why uh, there's so many in this data set. Manhattan is unsurprisingly the most expensive borough. Um, we can see using trend lines in these data plot of price to square footage. Um, if we look first at the, uh, the bronze, you can sort of see a trend line here. Queens, it's a little more steep. Brooklyn, it's a little more steep. And Manhattan, it's very steep. Uh, so that's what I expected. Um, but also, proximity to Manhattan is also a good indicator of price. So, Particularly if we look at Queens and the Bronx. And select the sales only over a certain price. Uh, you can see on uh, the Bronx, you know, close to Manhattan, or actually this is uh, along the B and D subway line. And in Queens, uh, close to Manhattan, like you have uh, Astoria. And now here, this is along the uh, number seven train. You have uh, Elmhurst and uh, Flushing, which is the end of the seven line. And the borough that's actually farthest from my hand and has no subway connection to any other boroughs is Staten Island. And as you can see, uh, it's just clustered in this incredibly small area. And so it's basically the only borough that has very expensive property sold. Well, that's about it. Thank you for watching. Okay. Hi, this is Lab 5. No, we don't want uh, Okay, so that's basically one of those. Um, 
dashboards I've seen, this is a really good one, right? Because it really. Hi, this is lab five. Oh, okay. Hi, this is lab five. Don't want to play it again. Uh, but basically, what it really helped you, right? What it really did, it it really allowed to put a lot of information in a single in a single dashboard, right? You see the price per square footage, right? And you, you see the, you know, the, the location of it, you map it latitude and longitude, you see the location. And remember, like you saw, like before we saw, he, he took only the high priced ones that were in Bronx and, 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 and in Brooklyn. And he could, you could almost see the proximity to Manhattan because Manhattan is the high, most high priced area, right? It's all the green dots. But by looking at this, you could also see the few places, a few, the few housing in, 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 in the Bronx and Brooklyn that were also high priced and you could explain it because they were either close to Manhattan or they were or they were close to Manhattan or they were on a subway line right you actually you could actually see the property located on the subway line right you could actually see it right he has like this tile here right you could see the subway line subway line here this is the number seven subway line here the proximity right this beautiful right by just selecting this and you could also select here on the bar graph, right, to see the sales per borrow. You can see Manhattan is the, the most one. You could click on the bar graph and only so see those sales and see where they are, right? And you could do the neighborhood here, right? And here's the PCA, but that he doesn't use that much. But you can sort of see, really see well, you know, how 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 do you bring everything together? So there's one, okay, how do you realize the amazing effect of what the video shows? Which tool package? Well, which tool, which tool and package should you use? Someone asks, how do you realize the amazing effect? Well, you will use D3. D3 allows you to do that, right? You can link those different visualizations together on a single dashboard. You can do that. It's easy, right? Well, not, not that easy, but it's, it's doable. He has done this, right? And he was actually an undergraduate student, right? He's done this. I'll give you another example of another student. Uh, like, let me just go to this one here. This is another one, um, no, this is not this one. This is from another student who took the course last year or two years ago. Doesn't have sound, but it's sort of similar interactive, right? You, you know, you click on a bar charts and you can, it, it tells you, the, you know, so there's New York, I think you can get, you can get such a geographical mapping, but you know, you can, it's really interactive, right? It tells you, you can click on things and it happens. You can see the crime rate. This is the crime rate per this area, right? So if you want to know where it's safe to live, then you can use this visualization, right? Number of crimes, it tells you. Level of danger, there's a database. Schools in the selected area, you can learn about the schools. Ethnicity, there's ethnicity. Right, so it's, it's what I'm looking for in your, final, in your final project is a dashboard like this, right? Where everything is on a single, screen right you can play around with it and that's you know that's what you want right and you can do that with d3 okay so i don't know how to And stop the video. <laughs> okay, so got this one. So there's no more videos I have. Okay, so now let's go to is there any questions about? Okay, I have a little more slides on the interaction actually. So now I remember this. So, you know, you want to use mouse interaction to highlight these points, right? So basically you click down, usually what happens is you go down with your mouse button on the left hand side and then you just, you know, trace out an area or you can even, there's even interfaces where you can, where you can create like a rectangle. You can just click a mouse, a vertex of a rectangle, another vertex, another vertex, another vertex, another vertex, and have this only the points that are inside the rectangle are going to be used and highlighted in the other visualizations, right? So you want to really have this mouse interaction 
which is called brushing, right? So brushing is basically activity where you select certain points in one visualization and then they get highlighted in another, okay? So that for example, in parallel coordinates, there's another interaction, right, that I showed you this already, right, where you can take these sliders down and then highlight certain clusters, right? So this, this, this is already built into the D3 tool, okay? So when you do your project, please don't just show me like interaction within a single visualization. Like don't show me just the interaction within a scatterplot display, within a scatterplot matrix, or don't show me interaction only within a parallel core display. It should go across visualizations, okay? From scatterplot, from scatterplot matrix to parallel core net, to whatever it is, right? You know, and then you should have like multiple things, right? You shouldn't have just pie charts and scatterplots should all have some, one of those more, more uh, interesting visualizations, by right? pie plot or whatever you like to have, right? And then bring them together in a meaningful way, okay? That really allows you to navigate. Don't just throw things together. Try to not tell a story with it, right? For your, for your video, I ex hopefully every one of you can create a video like the one you saw from, from the first, uh, you know, from the first narrated, show the story, show what you can see in the video, right? It's like a demo reel, basically. That's what you want to do, okay? So dashboards themselves, right? Don't make them do this like this five second test, right? This is like practical advice, okay? So dashboards should pass the five second test. You know, don't, don't make dashboards too complicated, otherwise people don't understand them. Definitely use the same color maps everywhere, you know, don't change them around, okay? Don't make it too colorful. And the, usually, what, what usually what happens is, you know, the most important view goes on the top left. Okay, whatever sort of an overview, whatever you want to manipulate, put that in the top left. For example, a map is usually often there, you know, here too, right? And then other interesting sort of things like that are that are about the topic of the of the dashboard are usually grouped around like this, you know, like this here and here it is, right? So this is sort of this what this this sort of the. Uh, main visualization where you sort of keep just the overview part, right? That could be manipulated by the lower ones, right? This is where you, and, the, and then you put the other ones around it, right? So usually never put, you know, six, that's probably, you know, that's probably the max. Don't put too much on it, right? You know, otherwise you get like a cockpit, cockpit like an air, airplane pilot, right? So, you know, the legends should go next to the views. Always put color legends, okay? Never, always have that, right? So people know, what, what the colors actually mean, right? So put the colors next to it. Try to choose colors that are sort of nice harmonizing with the others, right? Then, then don't, don't like have like one color map here and then a very different color map on the bottom, okay? So what should happen in five seconds? People, you know, it sort of should not be too overwhelming. So the dashboard should pass the five segment, second test mean people should sort of know within five seconds what is overall the dashboard about and and what what you know you know this is about for finding finding bigfoot and then here are the locations you know sort of look around on it and quickly sort of figure out what is actually going on right don't don't have diff, you know so this five second test maybe also 10 seconds it's okay right but but try to not make it too complicated and and and, and guide the user like have really the, the main view here and the top left and then have some detailed views around it, right? Always have one main view, you know, where you can sort of get a big overview. What is it all about, right? Obviously, this is about location, right? Because this is about finding Bigfoot. And here are like different different sightings, okay? And then here is like, you know, where, when it was, what what kind of, what, what season it was, right? So it's also interesting. You can highlight here and see, oh, like for example, you go here and highlight here and they say, oh, wow, most of the sightings here in this area is going to be is in spring, but if I go out here, interesting. Most of the sightings here are in in in, in fall, right? So obviously, Bigfoot always walks from the spring over to the you know to the in fall over to California and back, right? Maybe all the sightings of Bigfoot here are in the summer, right? Because it's moving back and forth. Who knows, right? I don't know, right? But that could be something you may find, right? Maybe Bigfoot is everywhere at the same time. Then you know it's probably an urgent urban legend, right? Because it can't be everywhere at the same time, right? If it's only one, right? So then you can sort of see this, right? And anyway, you can tell a lot of stories with this, right? And the number of sightings. So you know that's what I meant by five, five seconds. Try to not make it too complicated. 
I have some calculations is time consuming, how recalculate the data. Yeah, try to, you know, look at this, this, this video that I showed you, right? There wasn't really much calculated, right? It was more of a lookup, right? More a database lookup, right? So you want to sort of, I don't think you want to pre-compute a lot, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, if it's a dashboard, usually dashboards are usually don't do a lot of computation as they run, right? You know, they you to somehow, you know, or you can make a little, you know, little, um, you know, clock that runs around, but it of course shouldn't, it, it may be a few seconds is okay. A few seconds is okay. But if it's like maybe, you know, but if it's like 10 minutes, that's not okay, right? Because that is no longer interactive, right? 10 seconds, probably fine. You know, if you put a little, you know, you can maybe compute something, but, but start showing something already, right? Like start blending together or something like this. Keep the user entertained. But usually most of the dashboards, you know, sometimes, sometimes there, you know, there's dashboards that take some time, but, you know, usually they're meant to be interactive. Okay. So, you know, try to pre-compute things. Okay. So that's that, that's that one. So really final project, make a dashboard, unless you chose a project that, that makes, so they have basically have two, two, two choices, right? In your final project, either you make it that you take some data set and compute, create a dashboard or you, or you, uh, and then tell a story about it, or you, you come up with a new visualization paradigm, right? Some do some visualization research, then, then you may not have to do a dashboard, right? If you do visualization research, you can write a, you can write a, you can also write a report, uh, like a proposal, you know, that's also fine, right? So I don't, I don't want to kill research people, right? Some people want to do more research. They don't want to just do data, data visualization. You know, they, they can definitely do that, right? So just write, you can email me before if you think, if I think the idea is good, right? You, to get, to make sure that, that you, that you succeed, right? Then you, you definitely do that. So anyone who wants to do research instead of building a dashboard from existing data sets, then you, you can just email me your idea and I'll tell you if, if I think it's a good one or not, right? And maybe I can help you expand, okay? So, so otherwise, find interesting data sets, fuse them together, create a nice dashboard that is interactive and then, you know, make a video and so on, okay? So, any questions? I'll stay a little bit here and then if there's any questions, you can just put them in the chat board. So far, not. Okay, so let's go to um, another topic. The chat bot had disappeared. Okay. Chat. Okay, chat is back now. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about visual analytics. Okay, so let's do some more. Okay, so visual analytics basically is sort of oftentimes connected to dashboards, okay? But, you know, so oftentimes you do visual analytics within a dashboard. So visual analytics, why it, is, why it is, because there's lots of data and you wanna try to make sense out of them, okay? And then, you know, big data currently. Then usually you have this big data and then you try to create some actual in intelligence and make a lot of money from it, right? So that's basically the idea. And uh, so scalability is definitely a problem with visual analytics. So, you know, tries to, you know, so you have interac interaction to help you with scalability, data points, dimensions, data sources, and so on, right? Number of users can be collaborative, that there are many users over the internet or something like this, right? Users can be diverse and they may not have the same knowledge about visualization. That also could happen and the quality of data could be bad, right? There could be lots of noise, right? So visual analytics is basically trying to do this, right? So the goal of visualization, easy understanding, and then basically amplify perception, right? So you to try to make a visualization to amplify perception. And this is the, the slogan of visual analytics that's been coined when visual analytics was invented, detect the expected, discover the unexpected. Okay, that's basically, you know, what you're trying to do, right? You wanna detect what you expect, you wanna really prove it with a visualization, but you also want to maybe discover something you didn't expect. Of course, that's the great, that's great, right? When you do that, right? So these are, this is sort of the buzz sentence that the sentence of visual analytics, detect the expected, discover the unexpected, okay? And so what is visual analytics? It's basically visualization plus 
interaction, HCI, data processing, which is the analytics, storytelling, and scientific approach, right? So these are basically here. And uh, the book, there's a book, if you want to read it, it's actually it's, it's like written in late 2000s uh, by Jim Thomas and, and, and you can, you know, it, it has the agenda back when visual analytics was founded, this was around 9-11, like shortly after, mostly, mostly, then mostly coined because they, they wanted to find out their terrorist activity and try to use visualization to help them, help identify this, right? But long since then, it has gone everywhere, right? In business and and, and, and social science, wherever you want, it, uh, it does visual analytics. But this book has a good agenda. It's still pretty good sort of background material, and it's freely available from this web, web page. And uh, so visual analytics, that's another very important sentence. Visual analytics is the science of analytic reasoning supported by a highly interactive visual interface. So it's like a dashboard, basically. There's a highly interactive visual interface that triggers computational processes. They're hopefully fast, okay? You know, interactive, right? So, so, you know, so that's basically what it is. So here, there's, remember the Schneiderman mantra that I told you about, overview, overview in detail on demand, right? There's the Daniel Kai mantra of visual analytics. Analyze first, show the important, zoom, filter, and analyze further details of demand, right? So basically, you want to first analyze things. So this is the computation that happens before you show anything, then show what's important, and then let the user zoom and filter and analyze further, right? So first, you know, first you analyze what actually what to figure out what actually is going on, and then show what's really important. Then let the user go in, filter it out, and then maybe analyze further when there's something that you want to compute more about, right? Maybe you want to compute a mean just here, or you want to compute the dental standard relation just on this local, this local data, which you don't know about beforehand, right? So there's a few things, you know, that you can do. Maybe you only want to cluster in a particular small area and not the others. That would help to make the clusters more refined, right? And things like this. Okay, so this is the mantra of visual analytics by Daniel Kaim, who's here from University of Constance. And here's the triangle of visual analytics, which I told you before. There's analytics, visualization, and an interaction. Right, these three things basically are, you know, so that and your in, your interface essentially would support that. Right, that dashboard will support that. There's going to be interaction. There's going to be visualization. There's going to be some small analytics. Right, that that you know, may not take much time. Right. But this is really the paradigm of it, right? If you want to do more heavy analytics, you need a bigger computer, apparently, right? So that's what it is. So anyway, this is very important triangle of visual analytics, right? Interaction, visualization, analytics, and the science analytic reasoning support by highly interactive visual interface, right? That's basically what you want. So, okay, so let's go here. User visualization, okay. Because it's visual perception, you know, that's why you want this, why right? it has by bandwidth, you can quickly see patterns where the machine may not be able to see them, right? The machine tries its best to do some clustering, but maybe there's a few few overlaps that you that that only you can see, but the machine is not powerful enough or it's not 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 it doesn't have enough fuzzy reasoning knowledge or it doesn't know to have doesn't have the domain knowledge to see it, right? So the human is always in the loop help the machine analyze, right? It's not just the machine analyzes here, the human analyzes too, right? There's the visualization is there and anal analysis is done by the machine and by the human in the loop, right? Both of them do this, right? And they drive it, they drive this analysis analysis with the interaction, right? They basically drive both visualization with the interaction and they drive the analytics with the interaction, right? So they're both connected, right? And the machine does some analysis and then shows it to user by visualization. Okay, so this is all connected, right? Interaction drives this and this analytics is shown here. The machine analytics is shown here and, and interaction drives this, right? And visualization tells you where you should analyze, right? So this is all interconnected, right? All, all interconnected. So, you know, so I want to tell you a little bit, you know, about human visualize, uh, human human visualization and that it's imperfect, right? I want to warn you that, you know, I guess I already told you this before, right? Visualization is not, is not foolproof, right? The, the humans are imperfect because they look at the image and it may not, they may see something that, that is different, right? 
So humans also tend to overlook and ignore non-focused and unexpected objects, even when they're very close and obvious, right? Remember, detect the unexpected, but maybe humans don't see it, you know, because they don't have that much memory called working memory, right? You just don't, you don't, you don't remember enough from the previous frame to detect what is new in the new frame, right? So basically you have this change blindness, what I told you, what we talked about before, right? So, you know, this is because of limited working memory, right? You just can't remember everything, right? You may only remember a little bit and, and you know, you may, but, you know, you don't really know exactly the, what every detail was. You may also be distracted, you know, where you may not know, not pay attention to certain things, especially when it's temporally happening, right? And it's one on one big screen, maybe you'll see it, but if it's like, you know, temporal is even harder, right? So when you look at this picture here, okay? So, you know, there's like, show you this picture here. Let's say you see this picture here for a while. And then you look at this picture here. So what was different? You know, you may not know, right? What is different, right? But that's, just, that's a, 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 a natural image, right? But it could also be a sample, it could also be a scatter plot where there's one cluster there that, that, you know, that is different than the other, right? So what is different? Here's this one, here's this one, right? Actually, what's different is this part here that's missing here, but it's here, okay? This is basically here and not here. But when you look at it like this, you may, now of course you know it because I told you, but before you may not notice, right? So this is called change blindness, right? Example number two, okay, I'll show you a video. So now I don't, I'm not sure if this runs fast enough so we'll, 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 maybe I'll show you the real video. Maybe it's easier. Um, so in this video, we'll do some counting, okay? Very important that you get the right number, okay? Pay very close attention, okay? So I'll show you this. I'll, I don't wanna, I think it's too slow. I'll, I'll show you the video that I have in my, in my folder. Okay, so that's that one, okay? This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. So did you see 15 passes? 16, okay. Okay. Did you see anything else? But did you see the gorilla? Yeah, so not everyone sees usually this gorilla. Some people see it. You know, but did you really, did you notice that he was pounding his chest? This video is you know, this is a basically, you know, so basically this is a, a good example when you distract it, right? You're busy with something else and you forget, you overlook it. You just overlook it. I have another, another example of this. This is by Dan Simons. This is actually quite old, right? This is another example that you don't have to count anything, it, but it's the same kind of idea, right? So, you know, distraction experiment. I have the YouTube links too. So let's show this, let's look at this one. Okay, that's that one. The door study. This video shows a participant from a 1998 study by Daniel Simons and Daniel Levin. Watch what happens as the unsuspecting pedestrian provides directions. The young man on the left is one of the experimenters. He has approached the white-haired man and asked for directions. Watch closely as two people carrying a door pass between them, and the first experimenter is replaced by someone else. Like many of the people in this study, the pedestrian was entirely unaware that he was talking to a different person.
approximately 50% of the people approached in this study didn't notice when the person they were talking to was replaced by someone else. So, you know, this is pretty amazing, right? Because, you know, as you go through this, right? I mean, this can happen in real life. This can happen to you as you look at your, if you have a lot of data, right? Then you'll, you may miss something because you focused on one particular, one particular cluster that you really look in and then things change. Let's say you're like in a situation awareness application where you keep looking at data as they come through, right? You may overlook. And something that that is not normal, but you overlook it because you're focusing on one particular task. You may, you know, you know, you know that can happen, right? That can very much happen. So these examples show you this is a very human, very human thing, right? So the answer to this is really, you know, the really is the answer is that your visual analytics tools should should help the human anal analysts cope with these with these tasks, right? You basically, you know. First of all, visualization externalized memory. So you can you can memorize this in a visualization. But you like, then you can just look what the detail was. Like for example, you can show the past frames on the side, right? You can sort of compare them, or or you can do more. You can actually, you know, the, the analytics can detect the changes, right, and then highlight them to the user, right? So you know you could highlight that that you know what I showed you here, right? If you see if you see these these two frames you can you can highlight this in here that this has disappeared right if this is the frame before this is the frame now right you can have the, the machine computer highlight this area look analyst here something has changed you know like just a dot or a little arrow or anything right don't have to don't have to show the detail because the detail may may occlude a new detail right so you want to just highlight in some sort of highlight that or have a have a have a button that allows you to highlight what what has changed, right? Things like this. So you know the machine can definitely help with that, right? So you, you can just you do that, right? But you have to be aware of that, right? Emphasize these changes, right? You can basically show what are the changes, right? And then the, or the difference, right? You can flicker back and forth to to see the change, or you can emphasize the change in a, in a, in a, in a visualization, right? Just be aware of this, right? These are really really real challenges for humans that they can't. That they can't focus. You, you just can't remember everything because of this problem with working working memory, right? There's only so much you can remember in your in your brain, right? And then everything is sort of then it gets replaced by something new, right? You you cannot remember everything, right? So it's basically a, a buffer, right? It goes through and then new things come. You forget the old stuff, right? It keeps coming and going, right? It doesn't get committed to like some some long term memory by itself. Okay. So, you know, so this, this is basically this, right? So then, you know, what is actually visual analytics in the terms of like, in terms of, in terms of, um, you know, like the whole sort of strategy, okay? So what it really is, it's like a sense-making loop, okay? You're gonna have a visualization and you have computations for data processing and this form this loop, basically visualize, define, right? Gather, gather information, then re-represent, re of information, develop the insight, and produce results. Okay, so this is basically this loop here. Sense called the sense making loop. Gather information, re represent them, make them like change, maybe change them so they fit better in the overall picture. Develop, develop the insight, produce the result, and maybe gather more information. Right, so keep doing this. Right, it's like basically the human is always in the loop here. The human is in the loop and does all these steps. Right, this is another, another representation of this. That shows a little more the, the the what the flow really does, right? You have the external data sources first, and then you're gonna do some searching and some filtering, and whatever you find out is called is gonna go into the, what's called a shoebox, right? So it's the shoebox here. This is where you keep everything that you find worthwhile that comes out of the filtering, okay? And then then the shoebox, you know, you you react, you extract some more, right? This is called the foraging loop foraging loop and then this becomes an evidence file. This is basically the highlights of the shoe box. Here this is just sort of something you collect as you go through the data. You just throw things that are potentially interesting and then you go through the shoe box and look 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 for things that are actually interesting. Right. So now you put that in the evidence file. 
this keeps going back and forth, right? You may may see, oh, you know, I have something missing here. I'm going to go back here and find it and put it in the shoebox and go back and forth, right? So it's sort of a recurring process, right? And then from that evidence file, we create a schema. This is basically a way you organize your information, like some sort of structure that organizes it. For example, a layout on a screen, a, dash, a dashboard that shows different aspects, you know, stuff like this. And then once you have this, you, you'll, you'll, you'll build a case. You actually put some hypothesis. You start playing around with the dashboard. Okay, you start playing around with the dashboard and try to confirm some hypothesis. Sometimes you find out, wow, you know, I don't have enough data. Then you go, may have to go all the way down back here to the data sources and go back up here to the, until you form, you know, sometimes you realize, wow, you know, if I just had this other attribute, right? If I just had it around on my dashboard, then you have to go and look for it. Where is it? Do I have the data or is it just, you know, I don't even have the data, I have to search for the data even. Then find out what you want, right? You go back and forth, right? This is always going on back and forth. This is called, that's why it's called a sense maker. But in the end, if you build the strongest case possible, right? Build the strongest case possible, all your hypotheses came true, you can present. This vis in visualization again, right? You can present. But to this stage here, there's a lot of work to be done, right? If you want to like figure out what causes global warming, right? You have to go many times through this, through this here. Or what causes the virus outbreak, right? You have to go a lot of times through here. Or who is most affected, right? Who is most affected? And how can you how can you overcome the problems with the outbreak, right? That you have to search a lot through many, many data sets on Kaggle or whatever to figure out, right? So this is really a really good picture that by 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 you know that really shows this very, really well, right? That the foraging loop where you just collect evidence, sense making loop where you take the evidence and make a make a make a confirm hypothesis or reject them. And this is overall what your daily work as an analyst will be. Right? You really go back and forth between all the different different representations. Okay. So do remember this, right? This is a very important model, right, in which which visual analytics happens, right? This is a very important model. Okay. So then I have a little bit of something that you should visualizations to evoke the right thoughts. Okay. So you know, how many nines do you see? You know, you can, that's going to be really hard, right? You know, to, to figure out, you can go, you have to basically go through all the lines and figure, count the number of nines, right? Or you can just highlight them, right? Highlight them. So now it's here, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, done, right? And you sort of also know where they cluster, right? So you can have a machine to help you in your in your in your task, right? That this visual analytics also, right? It's just a simple analysis, find the number lines, but highlight them. But it's it's visual analytics. You now this is doesn't have to be complicated stuff, right? That can be very simple, right? Another thing is here. This is um, uh, but who has the best profit and who has the worst sales, right? It's like this table here: central, east, south, and west, and the broader coffee. Like, espresso, herbal tea, and tea, right? And these are different types of coffee, different types of espresso, different types of herbal tea, you know. You know, so you can look at these numbers. Trust me, you see this oftentimes, you see these tables. I think this is a, a very careless thing to do by people to put, to put, the, to put the, 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 the numbers like this, right? Because it's very hard to search it, right? So who has the worst sales and which product is it and who has the best profit, right? It's really hard. You see, well, there is some, some of them are red, so these are the, the, the losses, right? But then who really has? So it's very hard. You have to read all the numbers, you know, and it, it's impossible, right? So why would you not do something like this, right? Turn those numbers into bar charts. Easily seen now, right, what is, what is going on, right? You can just see who has the longer bar charts, who has the shorter bar charts. You can even map them. You can even take them and make them even, make them darker or not so dark make them darker when they're long, make them not so dark when they're short, make them red when they're negative, right? And make them not so, not so red when they're not so negative. You know, now you can easily see what's going on, right? You can really see, you know, what is my most profitable product, okay? In the, you know, in the West, everyone likes everything, right? And the West people really like my products. In the South, people really don't like tea. You know, in the, in the Central area, people tend to like, you know, tend to like espresso not so much. If that's, they don't like coffee latte at all, right? In central, east, and south. Little, they like a little more in the west. 
And you look at this, gosh, you know, this is, this is terrible. It's totally terrible, right? Totally terrible. And here you can see it, right? I think what they did was the sum of profits, they mapped the sum of profits to gray and the, the sum of sales to the length. I think that's what they did, sorry. I think all the other way around, right? They mapped like one variable to length and the other variable to, 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 uh, to, to brightness, okay? You know, so that you see, because there's two variables, now, sum of profit, sum of sales. So I think they took the sum of sales. I mean, they're heavily, they're heavily correlated, okay? <laughs> that's why they look very similar, right? That's why the black ones also are longer, right? So I think that's what they did. They used the brightness to map one variable and, 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 and length to another, right? But, you know, if you make such a, if you, if your boss or in your job, right, you have, you, you have a choice between doing something like this, something like this, people will, if you show this in a presentation to your management, people will clap their hands when they see this. People will be totally confused when they see this. You're going to spend a lot of time explaining. You're going to get a lot of questions. So, so now who has the biggest sale? Where can I, what should I sell where, right? It's very hard, but here it's simple, right? Quick to show, right? So, you know, so one thing you can learn in this class, use visualization, is simple stuff, right? Very simple stuff, but very effective, very effective, right? So also do some, do the right analytics, give people what they really need, right? Don't just show data with a visual representation, okay? Don't, maybe sometimes you have to compute something, right? On top of your data, right? Sometimes maybe, you know, doubling down on states for strong growth, right? I got, I found this somewhere on the internet. In which states should we invest additional marketing in dollars during our upcoming campaign? Okay, so this is basically the top three states. Okay, 30% of sales, top states are 50%. Yeah, so you can, these are different states. Okay, you know, that's good. This is the sales per state. California sold more, Texas, you know, not so much, right? But really, what you really want to show is there a better metric, right? You don't really, you want to, the sales is one thing, but this is the past. Right, that the sales is the past, right? You want to you want to look into the future, right? You want to look at the potential of the sale. You know, you want to look at the future, right? You don't want to just look at average sale per capita. You want to look at potential, okay? So you want to compute average sale per capita for top states, okay? Average sale per capita, and then multiply this by the current population of those states, okay? That'll really give you, you know, how many, how many, how much did you sell per capita? and then multiply population, then you're gonna get this figure, right? You're gonna get much better, you know, you're gonna get this kind of thing, right? So it's, it's, this looks small now because the sales per capita, right? Sales per million residents, but when you multiply by the current population, you know, this is, this is just a sales per capita. This looks smaller than this. And you may think, well, you know what? Not that good. But once you, once you multiply by the population, you find out California, is really a good potential. Texas is really good potential, New York. Actually, the sales in those states was already high in those states, right? But, but nevertheless, it's a more meaningful metric, okay? More meaningful metric, okay? So you wanna really, you, sometimes you have to compute something on top of it, right? You have to really take the data that you have and then multiply something with another data set, right? Like you take the, the sales per capita times the population and create this bar chart from that, right? And then you really have that, right? So, you know, so what you wanna do really is this, right? Then, then what I want you to do is walk away from this, right? Don't just blindly visualize your data. Analytics tries to take your data and try to compute something on top of it, right? Maybe take two things together and multiply them together to, to you know, to enhance, to give a better, to give a better uh, message, right? So you have to do that, right? You know, so this is kind of uh, one example that I that I know about, right? Don't be shy to take your raw data and compute something on top of it to, you know, to 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 show a bad to shoot to give a better insight, right? Than just without it, right? So that's basically what I wanted to tell you. So, so, so let's go to the. Is there any questions so far? So this is basically a map. So notice I chose, I, I moved the midterm to the last lecture. Okay, I moved the midterm to the last lecture because I think I need more time to figure out how to do this well, okay, because it's gonna be online. 
you know, so it's like, it's, it's going to be like the last lecture. Okay. So it's going to go to the uh, last, I forget what the, what the date was. Next time we're going to look at graphs and hierarchical data. Then we're going to look at maps, time varying data, infographics, memorable visualization. So, you know, so we're going to go to things. I think this, what I told you today was really important because, you know, because you need it for your, for your, because you're going to, your dashboard essentially is going to be a visual analytics interface, right? So you're going to be learned about visual analytics today. You may have some graphs, hierarchical data, and I'll show you next time how to do graphs and hierarchical data. You may have some maps or data with geospatial reference. I'm going to talk about how you can show the maps. Okay, so I was trying to go sort of from important to a little less important in terms of for your project at least. All of this is important, but these things are probably more important for your project, okay? Like hierarchical data, geospatial data, time varying data. This is the kind of stuff you're probably gonna have in your data, right? And you're gonna learn about this here, okay? So pretty soon, by right? the next week and a half, we're gonna talk about that by right? one by one. So are there any questions? about any of this okay then uh, today the lab today yeah uh, today lab three is due okay lab two was due on tuesday again the same deadline like anywhere in the world okay so it's like 8 a, 8 a.m i think in new york okay but don't worry if it's even a few hours late it's okay too you know so it's not that i'm not that hung up on these these times Okay, so if there's any no question, then we're gonna finish a little early today. Okay, so good luck. Okay, don't stay healthy. Don't um, you know get infected? It's coming. It's getting better apparently. You know, so let's not catch it at the last minute. Okay. Okay. See you next week.